On behalf of the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Role of Demographics in the Future of Work. My name is Michael Flynn, and I'll be your moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to let all of our attendees know that the NIOSH Future of Work Initiative, which was launched in 2019, and its corresponding work group have many ongoing and upcoming activities. This year, the initiative launched its webinar series, of which this is the third. Three webinars a year will be hosted, each focused on one of our nine future of work priority topics. Join us next year for the continuation of our series. If you'd like to learn more about the series and the initiative, please visit our website. As coordinator of the Occupational Health Equity Program at NIOSH, I'm pleased to participate in this important event. The Future of Work Initiative has always been of significant interest to me because it provides a way of operationalizing our understanding of the current restructuring of the world of work and how these fundamental changes in society impact health. Similarly, the central focus of the Occupational Health Equity Program at NIOSH is to understand and address how the structuring of society contributes to the inequitable, that is desperate, avoidable, and unfair distribution of work-related benefits and risks within society. As a result, the work of these two programs is intertwined and further elaboration of each, both separately and together, will not only contribute to our understanding of the social determinants of occupational health, but will serve as models of how to expand our current approach to occupational safety and health as a field, as evidenced by the following presentations. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to our two speakers for today. First, we'll hear from Dr. Laura Siren. Dr. Siren is a researcher in NIOSH's Western States Division. Within NIOSH's program portfolio, she is an assistant program coordinator for both the Occupational Health Equity Program and the Center for Marine Time Safety and Health Studies. For the past 15 years, she has partnered with community-based organizations, advocacy groups, labor management, and academic to advance public health. Dr. Siren earned a PhD in environmental and occupational health and an MPH in international health from Oregon State University. Second, we'll hear from Dr. Marie Ann Rosenberg. Dr. Marie Ann Rosenberg is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing in the Systems, Populations, and Leadership Department. Her program of research focuses on addressing occupational health disparities among youth and adult working populations at risk uh, for or experiencing one or more multiple chronic conditions. Her work also focuses on workers in, in the service industry, including hospitality and nail salons, who face particular challenges given that they are overrepresented by women, ethnic minorities, and immigrants. In addition to her research, Dr. Rosenberg serves on the CDC NIOSH Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing Cross-Sector Council. Dr. Rosenberg earned a master's degree in communities and population health at the University of Washington, Tacoma, and a PhD with a specialty focus on occupational and environmental health as a fellow of the CDC NIOSH, and complete, completed a postdoctoral training as a T32 fellow of the National Institute of Health and at the University of Michigan. And with that, Laura, thank you for joining us today and I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone. I appreciate this opportunity to discuss the future of work and ensuring health equity for a diverse workforce. Next slide, please. During this presentation, I will briefly review NIOSH's Future of Work Initiative, define what we mean by occupational health inequities, describe safety and health challenges faced by the increasingly diverse U.S. workforce, discuss some additional future of work factors, and then finally outline some potential solutions to address these issues. Next slide. To begin, I'd like to highlight this figure, which shows our Future of Work Initiative's three priority topics, the workplace, work, and workforce, and their subtopics. This is our guiding framework for future of work research and practice-based activities. 
Along the top, you'll note that some issues impact all three priority topics. These include issues such as emergency and disaster preparedness and response, as well as extreme weather conditions, which are exacerbated by climate change. So first, the workplace topic includes organizational design, technological displacement, and work arrangements. Second, work includes artificial intelligence, robotics, and technologies. Next slide. Third, the workforce includes demographics, economic security, and skills. So today, of course, we'll be focusing on workforce demographics. Next. So what's the central challenge when considering demographics and the future of work? We believe that it is ensuring the equitable distribution of occupational safety and health benefits and risks to all workers. So this means asking ourselves who will benefit from changes to the workplace and work and who will face increasing risks. Next. These questions bring us to, to a discussion of occupational health inequities. And we define occupational health inequities as preventable differences in injury, illness, and fatality that are closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. And these inequities can result from imbalanced power relationships, including those that, are, that often occur by race, ethnicity, nativity, gender, sexual orientation, age, class, disability, and or neurodiversity. They can lead to differential employment opportunities and the unequal exposure to and susceptibility to workplace hazards. Next slide. An increasing share of the total US workforce is racial and ethnic minority workers and foreign born workers. As a whole, these workers experience higher rates of injury, illness, and fatality. They are highly concentrated in non-standard work arrangements, for example, day laborers, seasonal workers, and independent contractors. And they're also concentrated in more hazardous occupations. Based on their gender, identity, and sexual orientation, workers may experience exclusion, discrimination, and violence. For example, women are disproportionately affected by workplace violence, with women of color and immigrant women facing additional forms of harassment and discrimination. Working mothers are often not provided uh, you know, with sufficient workplace or societal support and resources to balance their paid work demands with their reproductive plans and caregiving. Additionally, the percentage of US adults who openly identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer is increasing primarily among the millennial cohort. And these LGBTQ workers deserve supportive, inclusive, and safe workplaces. When workers fall within lower socioeconomic status brackets, including lower incomes, they may experience more unstable and unpredictable work scheduling practices. And these may negatively affect their safety, health, and well being, and that of their families. The multi generational workforce may also experience disproportionate challenges. In particular, the proportion of older workers has arisen and is expected to grow through 2050. Although older workers tend to experience fewer injuries and illnesses than younger workers, when injury and illness do occur, it often requires more time to heal, or it's more likely to be fatal. Additional concerns may include managing possible diminished physical capacity, higher rates of musculoskeletal conditions, and chronic diseases. Younger workers who are aged 15 through 24 are twice as likely to visit an emergency room due to a work-related injury than workers who are 25 and over and workers who are under 18 years old are especially vulnerable to experiencing work-related injuries and fatalities. Now, workers may also be members of multiple socially marginalized groups and experience overlapping structural inequities. Unfortunately, institutional efforts to document and improve safety and health outcomes may not always adequately include the experiences and perspectives of historically excluded social groups. 
So next, I'm going to highlight some future of work factors that may disproportionately impact certain demographic groups of workers. So one of these factors is technological development and evalu evaluation. Looking to the future, we want to ensure that first, technologies do not harm workers, and second, that any protections are provided equally among all workers. There must be efforts to address any racism, sexism, or other forms of discrimination that may be built into machine learning algorithms underlying artificial intelligence systems, which can increase occupational health inequities if they're left unchecked. In terms of personal protective equipment, or PPE, historically, the full range of workers' body shapes and sizes across the United States have not been considered during the design process. For example, improperly fitting PPE is a major and a growing challenge for women in the modern workplace, especially in more hazardous occupations like construction and firefighting. Protecting the increasingly diverse workforce requires that workers have properly fitting tools, machines, workspaces, PPE, and wearable devices like exoskeletons. Next slide. Climate change is a future of work issue that impacts the workplace, work, and the workforce. Climate change will increasingly present hazards that disproportionately impact certain workers who are already at higher risk for occupational injury, illness, and fatality. For instance, immigrant workers and those of lower socioeconomic status are frequently employed in high-risk occupations, um, such as agriculture, construction, transportation, and emergency work. These workers are often subject to outdoor extreme weather conditions, which are exacerbated by climate change. They may face a combination of risk factors, um, including lack of quality training, poverty, seasonal, seasonality of jobs, lack of decision-making autonomy, and extreme work conditions. Low-wage workers who are disproportionately racial and ethnic minorities and foreign-born individuals also often reside in neighborhoods and housing that are more susceptible to extreme weather events. Additionally, they're more likely to be employed in cleanup and rebuilding efforts, and rebuilding efforts may expose them to more hazardous condi conditions with less government oversight and access to protective equipment. And these concerns will likely grow over time, um, given an expected increase in extreme weather events and also increases in the number of foreign-born workers um, due to increased global climate-related migration to the United States. Finally, young people who are already entering the workforce during a time of rapid technological advancements have reported facing increasing uncertainties and stressors about their futures due to climate change. Next slide. So there are many potential solutions to addressing these issues and, and inequities. And these can include implementing worker-centered policies and programs, fostering workplace inclusivity and worker empowerment, developing inclusive technologies that do not cause harm to workers, mitigating global climate change, incorporating new perspectives on work as a social determinant of health, moving from a biomedical to a biopsychosocial model of occupational safety and health, and improving research in order to better understand safety and health disparities among different groups of workers. So now I'm going to discuss these last three points in more detail. Next slide. To ensure that the future of work benefits all workers equitably, traditional occupational safety and health approaches should be complemented with new perspectives that view work as a social determinant of health and that address social aspects of health and well being. So, earlier, when defining occupational health inequities, I briefly mentioned how social aspects, such as power imbalances between people, can affect their safety and health outcomes. The thinking about social determinants of health. Um, these are defined as con the conditions in which people live, learn, work, play, worship, and age. And they affect a wide range of our health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and our risks. The social determinants of health have been categorized into five domains, 
These include economic stability, which explicitly includes work, education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, and social and community context, which also explicitly includes work in the definition. So to improve occupational safety and health outcomes at a population level, we should incorporate work into broader public health practice and research. And in this list of the five domains, you know, you can see how employment status and type of work that people do can influence all, all of these domains. If, for example, your job type and income can influence your and your family's education, access and quality, your healthcare access and quality, and the neighborhood in which you live. Next slide. So another suggestion is to shift our thinking from a strictly biomedical model of occupational safety and health to a more comprehensive biopsychosocial model. So in fact, occupational safety and health has its historical roots in social medicine. During the Industrial Revolution, physicians and others explored how social and economic conditions affected workers' safety and health. But during the past 50 years or so, we've moved towards a narrower biomedical model. And this biomedical model focuses on identifying and eliminating a specific, a specific cause of injury or illness or fatality. And this model has resulted in great achievements for protecting workers. However, we know that given continuing occupational health inequities, we need a more nuanced perspective on work and its impact on population health. So a biopsychosocial model explicitly accounts for how social arrangements play into the inequitable distribution of work-related risks and benefits. And it involves a deeper understanding and analysis of the social determinants of health. And we hope that utilizing this model will help us to advance occupational health equity. Next slide, please. Finally, we can conduct more inclusive research. And this involves asking ourselves, how do occupational safety and health organizations contribute to exclusion and inequities? And most importantly, what can we do differently to make improvements? So we can conduct more inclusive research by identifying and engaging with community partners and affected workers, ensuring that data collection tools include key demographic variables such as race, ethnicity, nativity, sex, gender, age, income, and educational status, correcting for potential bias in recruitment methods and scientific models, for example, historically, the 70 kilogram man uh, who is seen as the standard human in toxicology, which effectively erased women. And also we can ensure that unconscious bias does not negatively impact our research questions, our approaches and research outcomes. So doing this can involve attending training sessions on the nature of bias and unconscious bias, promoting self-awareness and open discussion to identify and correct our biases. And again, incorporating researchers and study partners from diverse backgrounds. Next slide. So for references on the materials that I've presented, um, you could see the NIOSH science blog posts which, with links here, and these will include citations for these materials. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura, for that very interesting presentation. Um, and now I'd like to turn the floor over uh, to Marie Ann um, uh, for her presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. For the next 15 to 20 minutes, I want to engage us in a conversation on the experiences of particular worker groups, given their demographics, and more importantly, on the implication of how we conduct research and how we practice to effectively meet the workers' needs and sustain a healthier workforce now and in the future. Next slide, please. I would like to note that I have no conflict of interest. Next slide, please. Here are some of the key areas that I will focus on today. First, I will describe how hotel workers exemplify a need for demographic-centered approach to address occupational health inequities. 
I will also highlight some challenges and gaps in how we practice and conduct research among vulnerable workers. And lastly, I will bring forth the need for innovative approaches to address these challenges aligned with the future of work. Next slide, please. Now let's dive in the area of how hotel workers exemplify a need for demographic-centered approaches to address occupational health inequities. Next slide, please. It is important for us to be on the same page in terms of concept definitions when we are talking about hospitality. The term tourism and hospitality are often used together or even interchangeably. Though the, there are some overlap, these two terms do not necessarily refer to the same work environment, worker task, or exposures. When we talk about hospitality, we see that there are many sectors such as tourism and travel, accommodation, food and beverages, and recreation. Tourism refers to travel outside of one's normal environment, including international travels, cruises, and casinos. The food and be beverage sector includes restaurants, catering, bars and cafes, etc. The recreation and entertainment sector encompasses attraction, museums, parks, and sports. And lastly, we have the accommodation sector, which pertains to lodging and temporary stays. This sector includes motels, hotels, beds and breakfasts, timeshares, resorts, etc. So when all these sectors are put together, one can agree with the definition of hospitality as being the business of people helping, um, the business of helping people to feel welcome and relaxed and to enjoy themselves. For the purpose of this talk, I will focus on the accommodation sector of hospitality industry, particularly those who work in hotels. Next slide, please. Hotel workers number around at around 8.3 million. Of course, this number was before the pandemic. The largest group of workers in hotels are the guest room attendants who are primarily women and largely racial and ethnic minorities. Several terms have been used for guest room attendants, including hotel room cleaners, hotel maids, and housekeepers. When talking to the workers directly myself, I have found that they prefer being referred to as guest room attendants as they believe that the other titles have a demeaning or condescending tone. So moving forward in this talk, I will stick with guest room attendants or GRA for short. GRAs have the highest rates of workplace injury compared to other hotel workers. A 2010 study noted that 99% of guest room attendants were women, 76% were Latinx, 89% had English as a second language, and 88% had just high school education or less. Even though they had pain that were severe enough to miss work, or seek medical care, these workers still did not report to management or workers' comp. And they even reported only half of the claims were accepted. They were also, there were also, a, there's also a disconnect with physician follow-up as well as poor management effort to follow recommendations for alternate or modified work. Next slide, please. Workplace hazards um, and exposures usually fall within those common types. We have chemical hazards, which for the GRAs include the cleaning supplies that they have that they use on a routine basis to complete their task. Biological, such as being exposed to someone's bodily fluid, which um, while changing bed sheets, for example. Physical, which includes noise, vibration, heat, and cold, as well as repetitive motions. Lastly, we have psychosocial exposures, which relates um, heavily to stress at work. Next slide, please. In addition to high reports of injuries, GRAs also experience sexual um, harass harassment. A 2015 survey of 500 GRAs in Chicago found that 49% of the workers experienced indecent exposures. So the workers um, reported that the, the guests answered verbatim uh, the doors naked, exposed themselves, or flashed them. In this Chicago survey, women working the food Service, uh, the food service or hospitality industry experience higher levels of um, sexual harassment than other women nationwide. To date, as you can see from this timeline that I created here, there have been some mandates to address this issue. The mandate call the mandates call for the employers to provide panic buttons for the workers. However, we have yet to fully evaluate the effectiveness of these measures. 
We do not know if employers are actually uh, just checking the box saying that they have this measure in place or if they actually have a clear process for when an event occurs. When the worker who feels threatened presses the button, what happens? Who answers the call or um, who's on the other line? What systems have been put in place to support the worker who experienced the event? And what are the repercussions for the guests who actually assaulted the worker? Would they be allowed back in the establishment? We don't know. So for an industry that really thrives on the volume and satisfaction of customers, this is a big and impactful un undertaking. Next slide, please. With the goal of understanding the impact of work, of work stress and the health on the health of these workers, we conducted a pilot study to look at job strain, discrimination, and allostatic load among a sample of 30 GRAs. Allostatic load represents the wear and tear of the body in response to chronic stress exposure. We found a high association between job strain and discrimination and high allostatic load. So clearly there is a patho pathophysiologic embodiment of the stress that these workers experience. Of course, this was a pilot study. So we need a larger study to really be able to um, have a better understanding of this association. Next slide, please. More and more hotels are now moving towards going green by adapting eco-friendly operations with the goal of reducing waste and lessening negative environmental impacts while lowering operational costs and boosting their competitive edge. There are some states that have established certificate programs for hotels to go green. In 2010, there were about 12 states that were participating in the program. This table you see here shows some examples of green activities in hotels in Virginia. There are quite a bit, um, uh, there's quite a bit written about the phenomenon of hotels going green. However, we lack data on whether and to what extent this movement affects employees' health and well being. So far, the few studies that exist have been in, in international regions. For example, one study in South Korea noted that nature friendly environments in hotels decrease burnout which in turn led to increased job satisfaction and job performance among hotel employees. We need more data, of course, on this phenomenon, especially in hotels in the US. When we talk with, when I talk, when I've talked with hotels workers, some say that going green actually create, creates more work for them. For example, customers can opt not to um, get their room service during their stay for hotels that have gone green. And this means for the GRAs who finally get in the room that they find a dirtier room and that would require more time to clean, which they don't have. Next slide, please. So we also see how technology is starting to dominate industries and the way people work. These are some tech smart examples that are being implemented in hotels. When, you, when we think about those approaches such as contactless payments, Customers are not then encouraged to walk around with cash anymore and to leave tips for the workers, which is a big deal. And that's just the ice um, uh, of the below the iceberg. Um, there are some uh, concerns of technology not complementing the workers' experience, but actually replacing the workers entirely. Hotel robots can have the capacity to perform housekeeping work, such as vacuuming. And these developments definitely have implications in terms of job security for the workers. Next slide, please. So from, from the previous talk with Dr. Siren, we know now that the nature of work is changing, especially across these three facets, such as um, workplace, which includes work design and environment, work, which includes factors such as displacement due to increased use of machine, robotics and technology, and the workforce, looking at the aging and immigrant workforce, for example. So um, if we were to apply these facets of the future of work in the hospitality industry, especially for hotel workers, and narrowing down to the GREs, this is what one would see. We see that for the workplace, they are dealing with issues of workloads, such as excessive numbers of rooms to clean and time pressure and lack of benefits. We just talked about the potential impact of technology for these workers. And especially looking at the workforce itself, we see that the workers are predominantly women, overrepresented by racial and ethnic minority groups. They're fairly young and fitting in the lower scale of socioeconomic status. 
And for this worker, for this worker group, lacking autonomy and little opportunities for growth and upward mobility with, within their workplace is an issue. Next slide, please. We cannot talk about workers in this industry without really taking a look at the current trends given the COVID-19 pandemic. This figure here shows the unemployment rate among workers specifically in the, the accommodation sector. You see the rapid increase in unemployment starting from January 2020 to January of this year. In January 2021, the unemployment rate was 23.1%. And, and as of October 2021, the unemployment rate in the accommodation sector was 12.9%. For hotels specifically, the unemployment rate is 13.8%. Next slide, please. The American Hotel and Lodging Association conducted a survey in November of 2020. Based on the survey, 70% of hotels reported that they couldn't last more than six months without increased occupancy or additional debt relief. 63% had fewer than half of their pre-pandemic full-time staff working. 52% feared that their hotels would close without further aid. And nearly 100% mentioned that they would apply for second paycheck protective program loan if available. In mid-February of last year, 2020, during the first surge of COVID-19, hotels had already lost over $13 million billion in room revenue. They noted that the leisure and hospitality had lost 2.8 million jobs during the pandemic that have yet to return, representing more than 25% of all unemployed persons in the US. The unemployment rate in the accommodation sector specifically remains at 225% higher than the rest of the economy. Next slide, please. This is the working conceptual framework for my work relating to occupational health disparities. I propose that the individual worker's health and well being is influenced by their work, which includes mul these multiple facets their social identities, where they could experience discriminations based on the many isms, such as classism, racism, and ageism. The worker's health and well being is also influenced by their social support within their community and family. I included the key concept here, which is transborder connection to capture the international connections for foreign born workers and within state connections as well. The workers health and well being is also workers health and well being is also influenced by systemic level factors and policy. All these domains, if ill addressed, can lead to poor physiologic responses that I measure through allostatic load, which symbolizes the wear and tear of the body and moving down to poor mental and physical functioning and ultimately premature death. And of course, since we are talking about workers, these responses have direct um, impact on their work productivity in terms of absenteeism and presenteeism. Next slide, please. So the pandemic has heightened the vulnerability of these workers across these various domains. We just talked about how the issue of job loss for these people in this industry during the pandemic. Those who remain employed experience increased pressure because they now have more workload due to, due to decreased manpower. So when we think about the significant impact of the pandemic among vulnerable workers, they are indeed facing job insecurity, experiencing direct loss of li livelihoods, Many were already lacking access to benefits and with COVID-19, if they were to be infected or need to be quarantined or even needed to care for a loved one, they would need to receive, um, they would not receive paid sick leave. I interviewed a few workers during the first surge of the pandemic. In addition to issues relating to job and economic security, as well as increased pressure at work, they mentioned lacking um, transparency and communication from leadership. And of course, the vast lack of knowledge about COVID-19 did not help the situation in terms of what employers could and should do to protect their workers. Next slide, please. We also have seen deep disparities in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on particular neighborhoods and groups. And this conversation continues even relating to the, the vaccine in terms of access and trust, et cetera. Next slide, please. We have also seen um, a key aspect um, of the pandemic is isolation. So we know that the, we know the importance of social support as a booster for resilience and health and well-being for individuals and communities. So when we imagine how isolation, the need for quarantine and the inability to travel back home for those who are foreign born, and we can imagine how that affects those workers. 
Next slide, please. We are, we are also seeing a rise in uptake and frequency of substance use during the pandemic across the U.S. population. I recently received funding to look exactly at that mental health and substance misuse among hotel workers as a result of COVID-19 added stress. Next slide, please. We have also seen uh, increased reports of hate crimes and discrimination among particular working groups during the pandemic. Another group, for example, that I work with are those who work in nail salons, and these workers have been really having such negative poignant experiences due, excuse me, due to COVID-19 and beliefs around the origin of the virus. Next slide, please. With all of, of its uncertainties and associated fears, COVID-19 definitely has increased people's fight or flight response. We lack scientific data to highlight the physiologic responses to address um, this added stress. Next slide, please. Know that the pandemic has tremendous impact on mental health as well as physical functioning. There are reports on the concept of long COVID which really questions the nature of full recovery among those who were infected by the virus. Next slide, please. And of course, a major outcome of chronic exposure to and heightened facets of those domains of stress is, um, is uh, increased work productivity. Next slide, please. And lastly, um, added stress related to um, premature death. Next slide, please. Certainly, we are still in the midst of the pandemic, but we are beho behooved to really start thinking about what things will look like post-COVID for these workers. For example, the pandemic has really now pushed for um, increased and faster implementation of service robots as customers become more hesitant to partake in interpersonal human interactions in fear of um, being infected. So I anticipate an increased speed in the uptake of automation and technology, and it's important to th and it's very important to think about what that means for the workers and their work experiences, and also in terms of job security. Another aspect that we we need to think about for these workers is that since many of the workers who lost their jobs were forced to really explore other avenues to make ends meet. These workers may have realized that there are other things that they could do to take care of their families, such as looking for jobs in factories, Amazon, and other delivery services, especially for the younger worker, worker groups. So it will be interesting to see whether they come back to being DRAs, for example, especially if they were um, able to experience newfound flexibility that they didn't have before in terms of work-life balance. There is a definite need to explore not only where these workers ended up, how their experiences differ, and more importantly, their intent to return. And of course, we can go beyond thinking about the GRAs because they are emblematic of low-wage, underinsured, racial, ethnic minority women in the service sectors who are invisible to the population that they serve. Next slide, please. So let's quickly talk about the challenges in the way we currently practice and conduct research among vulnerable workers. Next slide, please. There are definite gaps in terms of how we monitor. For example, major large, um, majority of large public data sets lack occupational ex health exposures. They lack industry specific details, which then really does us a disservice in really understanding risk exposures and outcomes. For example, right now, it is really challenging to find large data set, um, large data sets with information about substance use by occupation. These data sets lack inclusivity, representation, and specific detail outcomes. Next slide, please. With the understanding of the importance of inter the intersectionality of the multiple social identities um, that the GRAs can wear in terms of hat, I interviewed some GRAs about their experiences. Here are some statements from a participant. If someone has a higher position at the job, she does, she does whatever she wants to you. You are obligated to stay in the job because others will take your place. Me, myself, I experience being mistreated and, ha and having a mental condition. Someone who comes from a university, she gets a job. That person too can lose their job, but when she gets a job, it's much more stable. You will not find a nurse in the morning to just get fired. They don't do that, nor a doctor, nor an accountant, nor an engineer, but they can send you 
um, away whenever they want and however they want. So this participant's quote really highlights the complexity of the workers' experience in terms of their education, social position, autonomy, and sense of powerlessness in, their, in, in the workplace. Next step, please, Next slide. The mission of NIOSH's healthy work design and well-being is to promote worker health, safety, and well-being by addressing multiple factors, including design of work, management practices, and the psychosocial work environment. We have also the NIOSH's Total Worker Health Initiative, which calls for an integrated approach and interventions that take into consideration upstream forces, as well as non and non work and non work factors impinging on the health and well being of workers. We conducted a focus group of um, a, a scoping review of workplace health interventions from, that are targeting hotel workers. We identified eight interventions, and these interventions focus on stress management, health check ed education, free health screening and education on access resources, reimagining re the cards by installing wheels to reduce pull weights. And lastly, um, one intervention focused on providing ergonomic friendly tools. And um, they did found reduction in back efforts. However, the workers ended up spending more time in the room. So really this you know, has us thinking, would the workers really use this tool, even if it's shown to actually decrease their ergonomic um, risk factors? None of these the interventions looked at management training and how to recognize signs of burnout, for example, or other signs of physical and mental distress among the workers. And also majority of these interventions did not provide much details in terms of efforts to be sure that these interventions were culturally appropriate. Next slide, please. So transitioning um, into a look at how we recruit these workers in research studies, we see in this table um, a combination of union-based community participatory approaches for recruitment, as well as um, uh, survey and interview data collection approaches. We see how the racial composition of these individuals could vary based on these methodological approaches. Next, next slide, please. Here is a graph showing the gender distribution across multiple job titles among a sample of 224 hotel workers that I surveyed. We see that the GREs are primarily women. Next slide, please. And in looking at the racial and ethnic distribution within the sample, the same sample, we see that a good number of GREs were white, which is not what we expected, right? Because of what we know, what we've seen in the literature in terms of who occupies this job title. But then again, you know, we're thinking about the fact that the recruitment was done via social media and that the data collection were permanently fully surveyed. So we, we really need to think about how um, we may have missed some key individuals to participate in this project. Next slide, please. Within this project, we see that higher burnout was associated with higher effort word imbalance. We found that both higher um, effort, effort we were at imbalance in job category were significant predictors of total work burnout for the total sample. And we see that the guest room attendants um, had higher burnout than all the other job category. So clearly job title represents the complexity of demographics in terms of gender and burnout. And again, going back to thinking about who would be the guest room attendants, and that's something to, for us to really ponder on. Next slide, please. And for the last section here, we see um, with that in mind, we do note the need for innovative and inclusive approaches for demographic centered research and practice aligned with the future of work. Next slide, please. So in terms of these recommendation, you have, you have heard um, them from Dr. Siren previously, and they include more inclusive approaches in terms of injury reporting, really addressing worker needs, especially those who are experiencing chronic conditions, really looking at what return to work uh, looks like for those workers, workers who are experiencing mental health needs, really identifying and training managers on how to identify those who are in distress, really targeting interventions that are developing interventions that are culturally relevant, and really important to um, make sure that the, the workers have a sense of value and that the, the company values them and not just focused on the bottom line. And of course, COVID-19 has really shown the importance of having a clear plan for crisis management across industries and organizations. 
and clearly the need for multidisciplinary collaborations to support workers. Next slide, please. In terms of research, as I quickly highlighted, the need to really be thoughtful about um, the design, right? Recruitment approaches, your methods of, of, of um, data collection. Recruitment is, is ideal if it's multi-pronged. If you have connection with the union, that seems to work well. A union, community-based participatory action, as well as survey, all of these need to take into, into consideration and not really um, focusing on one method versus the other. And really thinking about policy, the importance of policy. During the onsurge of the, uh, the the pandemic, I interviewed some workers and they did highlight the need for clear organizational policies and how having a policy in terms of from the CDC guidelines in terms of what employers could do that really helped. So having clear guidelines and workplace policies um, really help and really focusing on accountability um, for the employers to promote the health and safety of workers. And also immigration policy has a big role for these workers given that the, their demographic. Last slide, please. So in terms of ending reflection, um, what is your role as clinicians, right? We are behooved to think about our roles as clinicians, occupational health professionals, researchers, and advocates in promoting demographic-centered work to address occupational health inequities now and in the future. Next slide, please. And at this time, I would like to acknowledge these individuals on this slide. And next slide, please. And thank you for your time and attention. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the both of you. Now we have time for questions and answers. Just as a reminder, uh, please add any questions uh, you have into the Q&A box on the Zoom uh, uh, app here. And I believe I have access to it now. So I'll just start off. Uh, one question is, I think for you, uh, Marianne, it says, what health conditions are most worrisome to GRAs? Thank you for this question. So right now, what we've seen in the literature is high reports of back pain, right? So musculoskeletal injuries, but also in some other works that I've done, I've seen reports of chronic conditions. So um, we need more work, but what we see is high prevalence of, of pain um, with this population. And also we're seeing increase um, development of chronic conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, the next question says, we routinely translate our occupational health patient facing forms into Spanish. Are there other languages we should consider accommodating as a standard? At present, we utilize the translation service for patients that do not speak English or Spanish. Uh, maybe Marianne, you could start with that and then uh, Laura to follow up on that, you might talk a little bit about some of the challenges of promoting health within a multilingual workforce that I know you've had experience in. Sure. So um, thank you again for this question. My answer will be it depends, right? And this is how important, why it's very important for us to understand the population we serve and the community. So for example, for the nail salon workers that I, I'm working with, the, the language translation will need to be Vietnamese and, um, and, and Korean, for example, and Thai. So I think it's very important for you to understand the population in order to really address their translating needs. Great, Laura? Yeah, that was a fantastic response. Um, I echo Marie Ann's uh, response there. Um, and, you know, I think also thinking about not just language, but literacy as well. So, you know, the reading level of the population. Um, you know, uh, I think generally for the US population as a whole, oftentimes we don't want to write um, materials above an eighth grade reading level, I think. Maybe Mike, you could correct me if that's out of date, but thinking about the literacy level um, and cultural uh, relevance as well is important, but I'm very happy to hear that there are interpreter services that can work with people in real time too. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, the other question here is once EHRs contain useful work information, how do you see clinicians using that to address health inequities? 
I guess I'll leave that up. Perhaps Maria, you can start and then Laura. Um, actually, I'm unsure how to <laughs> answer this question. So Laura, you want to take that on? Sure. So, you know, um, clinicians, I'm not sure, but from a researcher's perspective, I think researchers, um, the more data, the better, right? We're always greedy for more information. Um, it is very useful to have um, this information. So, you know, once, once we can understand, you know, occupation work in, work information in the electronic health records, we can do analyses by occupation to understand how different workers, um, you know, have different outcomes. Um, that would be my response. So from a research perspective, it could be very helpful um, to improve our analyses and to improve, um, you know, the type of information that we're able to share with the public and then share with clinicians as well. I think one other thing that I've heard of as well is that perhaps producing fact sheets or simple information that if there were a, an occupational exposure that came up during, you know, from the electronic record, it would recommend that the, the physician could print something out and provide, uh, you know, health information to the patient on a specific topic that, that they might be facing at work. And can um, I add to that? Um, my sure. So I think... Um, so it's, it's good to see that, you know, the EHRs have work information because the other thing that we've talked about in, is in terms of, I think all health professionals should have some type of training relating to occupational health. Because if you're a healthcare clinician and you're providing care to a patient who's so keeps showing up with, you know, upper respiratory distress and you don't ask them where they work, what type of work they do or, or things like that, I think that's important to highlight. Okay, great. Um, and another question here, it says, thank you to both speakers on presenting important information. Does NIOSH currently work with labor unions as partnership organizations in disseminating information to vulnerable workers, especially those most vulnerable with regards to emerging workplace hazards, workplace protections, and avenues for employment to achieve work-life balance? Uh, Laura, maybe you can start off on this one. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for the question. Um, yes, NIOSH does work with labor unions and each research project and each, each researcher has in different partners for their projects. So yes, we do routinely work with labor unions. Um, in my own work, I've been trying to reach out to labor unions and worker centers um, more often and to build these types of partnerships and relationships um, for exactly this reason that we do want to reach underserved workers um, and center workers' voices in our research and in our outreach um, and materials. Thanks. And, and Marie, do you have anything to add? Sure, I will just jump in that as somebody who works in academia um, and working with um, those workers who are really unseen and underserved, people are saying that they're hardly um, hard to reach, but I say they're hardly reached, right? So I had to do the back work and connect with the labor, with the union, with the local union to establish these relationships. So I think it's important, right? And I think it would be good for something to happen at the NIOSH level and not just individual worker, individual um, uh, researchers like myself who are reaching out. And one final comment from my experience working in these communities, I think, you know, within the framework of the future of work, an area we need to think about as well as how uh, the new ways in which workers are organizing and representing themselves as well. I, you know, the traditional labor unions are still there and are still very valuable partners for us in our research. But as uh, Laura was mentioning, there are these newer, you know, uh, manifestations of, of worker organization or worker groups like worker centers and whatnot. And so I think it's important to also understand how workers as groups may be responding to the challenges and, and the new reality of the future of work and how society is changing as well. Um, I think those are all the questions we have in the box. If there are any other questions, please add them. The, the one final thing I'd like to ask is, you know, I was struck, Marianne, by your discussion on how the discourse around uh, climate change and, and green solutions in uh, the hospitality industry may be uh, harming workers or resulting in negative impacts for workers. I'd be interested to see if either of you 
your opinions on how this move towards the future of work and this transition to a biocycle social approach to occupational safety and health, um, what are some of the opportunities that that might present us with, either it's through the social determinants of health model or whatnot, uh, to incorporate work, worker-related health and safety issues into society at large? Yeah, so this is this where this is where I'm puzzled, and this is where I'm 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 living in right now in this question, Michael. So, um, it requires a conversation, right? Not only with the manufacturer of those um, uh, robots and technology devices, but also the 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 organization itself, right? So when you think about, um, so clearly we cannot forego technology, right? This is the, the way to move forward. So I think it's best for us to think about how to best leverage it. So I'm thinking about the work of the guest room attendants. A lot of the work that they're doing is really um, tasking on their body, right? So instead of, I, I could see them working next to each other, right? So instead of having the guest room attendants, for example, doing the bending to clean the tub, you could have the robot do that, right? But we really have to sit down and really see how they can work next to each other in a way that's safe for the worker and also where the worker is not going to lose their jobs because the worker could do everything. The robot could do everything. Okay. Great, and Laura, uh, you can answer that question, but the one final question did come in, so I'll let you answer the one I asked or this final one here. It says, for employers wanting to advance health equity through workplace policies and procedures, where do you suggest they begin? How can employers evaluate their current policies and procedures through a diversity and inclusion lens? Yeah, fantastic question. And I would say that um, communication between labor and management is key. So hearing from workers, inviting them to the conversation and discussion and incorporating their perspectives, I think would really be the key there. Yeah, I said what you said, Laura, this is great. And so it looks like we're, we're at time. So I just wanted to wrap up by thanking both of our speakers very much and for the Future of Work initiative at NIOSH for organizing uh, this important webinar. I, I think what we've seen here is a nice complement of presentations uh, with Laura providing us with this large overview of the paradigm shift within occupational safety and health and the need to account for some of the social structures that circumscribe the distribution of workplace benefits and risks that accompany the move to a future of work. Um, and then through Marianne's presentation, looking specifically how that plays out with a particular population in a particular work setting. And so I think they've given us a lot to think about, and I think they give us a lot of models on how we might move forward as the field of occupational safety and health evolves to meet the challenges of the future of work. So thank you all very much for your time, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.